Luke 1, and we're going to go to Ephesians 1, and be believing with me that I can get all this out. Listen fast. Um, I want to talk to you. I talked to this service last week about Jubilee, but I'm going to mention it one more time because I feel like the Lord's opening some stuff up. Um, But I want to, before we get started, we need to pray. But before we pray, let me tell a joke. A minister decided that a visual demonstration would add emphasis to his Sunday sermon. Four worms were placed in four separate jars. The first worm was put into a jar of alcohol. The second one was put into a container of cigarette smoke. The third one was put in a container of chocolate syrup. The fourth worm was put into a container of good, clean soil. At the conclusion of the sermon, the minister reported the following results. The first worm in alcohol, dead. The, first, the second worm in cigarette smoke, dead. The third worm in chocolate syrup, dead. The fourth worm in clean soil, alive. So the minister asked the congregation, what, do you, what did you learn from this demonstration? Maxine was sitting in the back, quickly raised her hand and said, as long as you drink, smoke, and eat chocolate, you won't have worms. <laughs> and it quickly ended the service. <laughs> All right. Well, y'all laughed good enough. I'm not going to tell another one. All right. Um, we're in an interesting time. You're in the, we're in an, inter- in an interesting year. And we're going into years that will be more interesting. Uh, they'll be perilous for those who don't believe. They'll be glorious for those who do. Um, those who are connected and lean on the system of the world, uh, the government, will experience hard times. But those who lean on and trust in, as Proverbs 3 says, in God will be shielded from that. In fact, I'd say they'll even prosper in terrible times. Um, So, you know, knowledge is power. In, in Proverbs 29, 18, it says, My people perish for a lack of knowledge. But if you look that word knowledge up in the, old, in the Hebrew, it means my people, lack, my people perish, my people die. And it doesn't mean die physically. It means die mentally. It means die while you're alive. We all know people that are dying while they're alive. And even Christians. But it mean, it's, what it means is my people perish for a lack of redemptive revelation. That word knowledge means redemptive revelation. Because if you don't have a redeemed revelation of the cross, you'll never be able to walk in the fullness of God for your life. And so today when I'm talking about favor, uh, I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about things. I'm talking about a higher level of living all the way around. I'm talking about walking in a place that helps you and helps those around you. So my goal is to end with three reasons favor comes. Next week I'm going to talk about four places favor comes from. Then we're going to declare some things and believe God. Because next week, I'll go ahead and, and um, yeah, how do I do this? Okay. You guys don't have to go to Luke 4.18, but I'm going to. All right? It's just a couple of uh, verses over. The reason I'm telling you this, and the reason I'm doing this in, before I um, talk about highly favored and what God said to Mary, is because of uh, just talking about the time we're in. All right. Help, let me understand. Let me help you understand something. That in the Jewish calendar, um, every 49th year is called the Shemitah year, which means release. That was uh, Don was right last week. It's a year of release. Now, the 50th year in the Jewish calendar is always the Jubilee year. The Jubilee year is. Kind of like it sounds. People get happy because they get their land back. They get stuff back. They become debt free. Yeah. They, uh, they, re- they receive freedom when they were bound. Okay, so the 50th year is the year of Jubilee. Then it would start over and be the first year again. Now, in the Jewish calendar, uh, it starts over on October 2nd, which is next Sunday. And it be- begins Rosh Hashanah, which is a 10-day period of repentance and just deep repentance before the Lord to prepare prepare for their new year. So every October 2nd is their new year. Now, when Jesus came and when he died, he, there have been 40 and one half years since the death of Jesus. 40 and one half years of Jubilee. Excuse me. Not 40 years. It's been 2000. Now this morning I did some math and if, as long as the math is basic, I'm pretty good. 
And so I took 2017 and divided it by 49. I'm sorry, divided about 50, because you have to include the Jubilee year to get the right number. When you divide that out, the number is 40.34. So there have been 40.34 years of Jubilee since the death of Jesus. So what's important about, the, so we're in the half part of that. So what's important about 40 and a half or the number 40? Well, all through the Bible, the number 40 has been a number of testing. Yeah. There was 40 days and nights that Noah was on the ark, right? Jesus was tempted 40 days, right? How many disciples were there? <laughs> okay, I was going to see if I could catch you. So 40 is a, is a very interesting number because it's a, it's a number of testing. And also... There was a whole book dedicated to numbers in the Bible. So God, there's a lot in numbers, all right? So what I want to tell you is that, and then even in, there's so much prophetic stuff that's got to come to pass before Jesus comes back. Yeah. That's why I prayed for your ancestor's seed to come to you. It needs to go somewhere. Yeah. It needs to be used for the kingdom before the kingdom comes. Yeah. Okay? And so when... We as a church are always, we're always looking forward. Prophecy is always forward. Favor is always forward. Grace is always forward. Grace is never for the past. It's always empowerment for the future. Favor is for what you're going to do, not what you have done. And so the 40 and a half is interesting because David reigned over the nation or the tribe of Judah for seven and a half years. After when he first became king, then he reigned over the nation of Israel for 33 years. Yeah. That's 40 and a half. Jesus, and he was a type and shadow of Jesus. Yeah. Now, just saw something. If you take the time that we're in, it's also we're in around the 6,000th year since the earth was remade, yeah. recreated. Not since the beginning of earth when God made it, but since it was void and without form, and he recreated the earth. Yeah. Okay. If you look at the book of Ezekiel in, in chapter 47, and you read it and you study it out, what you'll find is that Ezekiel, I believe, he was a seer, he was a prophet, and he could see into the future, and he saw, I believe he saw the year we're in right now. The reason I believe that is because if you take what he did and what he said, you, most of the time when you take a water source, take, say um, uh, you got a leak in your house, or not in your house, I won't say that, in your yard, and the water is just bubbling up. The further away you get from the source, the less, or the lower the levels get, yeah. the less wet it is, right? However, with God, the further away from the source the anointing gets, the anointing gets greater because it's being shared. When Ezekiel was taken out in the measurements that he took, uh, it says that the waters flowed from the sanctuary. I believe that's the church. Now, this prophecy will never be fulfilled if the church doesn't go out and be the anointing of God. And, to, and if you're not going out and being Christ, see... If Christ in you is the hope of glory, and you're more than a con conqueror in Christ, if, he, if you are in Him and He is in you, then who are you? I mean, it just makes sense. We're the body of Christ. Well, I don't say, I don't address Amy as, hello, head of Amy, and hello, body of Amy. I address her as Amy. Why? Because she's one. If Christ is the head of the church, then we are Christ in the earth. But a lot of people don't see themselves like that because they've been beat down by their parents, beat down by our religion that's told them everything they're not instead of who they are. Okay, so the 40 and a half years. Some sages, some very guys smarter than me say that because they, they believe this will be the last year of Jubilee on earth. That in the next 49 years, sometime, Jesus will return. Now, we all know by the way we look at things and prophecy that we are in some really interesting times. Yeah. Okay? And, and these guys that are smarter than me say, because it's the last year of Jubilee, that it will last up seven years. Wow. Now, the year of Jubilee that we're in right now ends on October 2nd. It's the 50th year of their calendar of the, of the different things. And they start different feasts at the first of their year. 
But if you look at the numbers, the 40 and a half, I felt like the Lord showed me something just a second ago. We're, we're in this year of Jubilee, but it's coming to an end. The number six, if there was going to be seven, if it was going to be an extended amount of time, extended amount of freedom, Jubilee, the number six is the number of man. But if you look at Ezekiel, as the water keeps getting higher, the numbers in Ezekiel, or the number if you add all that up, is 6,000, wow. give or take. And we are in that sliver of time since the recreation of the earth. All I'm saying is we're in a really interesting time. Yeah. Numbers don't lie. That's right. And God has a, I think he has a high, high regard for Christians who want more of him. Yeah. He wants to give us all we can take. The interesting thing about God is though, he'll never give you what you want. He'll give you what you can receive. Yeah. It would be like me giving Trin, he just turned 18, and giving him a Ducati racing motorcycle. He would love it. It would be a blessing, but it most likely would kill him because he wouldn't know how to use it. His character wouldn't support the blessing. It, it will later on, but right now it won't. So God will never give you more favor than your character can support. He just won't do it because he's a good father and he's merciful. And he doesn't want you to die. <laughs> he wants you to be able to use what he gives you for his glory. For three reasons, and we'll go into them deeper in just a little bit. I'll tell you real quick. The first reason God gives you favor is to show you He loves you and draw you in. The second reason is to pull you into a relationship and find out who He is and how He works. And the third reason is to give it to someone else. Okay, now, now that I've said all that and the time we're in, how many of you think that you could use more favor in your life, whatever you're doing? Could you, could you use more favor in your family? Yes. Could you use more favor with your children? Yes. Use more favor with your boss? Yes. Have favor to be a boss? Yes. I only got a few of them there. Yes. Usually the people that don't want to be a boss are the people that have been bosses. <laughs> they don't want to deal with people. <clears throat> They say ministry would be great if you didn't have to deal with people. <laughs> you also wouldn't have ministry, so it's kind of a double-edged sword. All right. So go to Luke 1. And oh, I didn't read. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I missed something on the, the year of Jubilee. So Jesus says in Luke 4.18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me and appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set the liberty of those who are oppressed, proclaim the, acceptable year, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now understand that when this happened, Jesus... A, a certain passage of scripture, when you would go into a synagogue, there would always be, the scripture would always be open to a certain passage. That's what you were supposed to read. The person that go up would read that. There would always be a standing for the reading of word. Then when the, scri or the, the rabbis would sit down, then they would begin to teach. Two interesting, a couple interesting things happened. One, Jesus went up and instead of reading the place that was open for him, he changed it to Isaiah 61. Now, they didn't have 61, they didn't have it numbered, but he changed it to that. Why? Because he read a portion of Isaiah's prophetic declaration, and he consummated it when he said it. Because there was nothing Jesus said that wasn't a seed, nothing he said that he didn't seal. And so when he did that, he said it, then he sat down, and it said that the chair that he sat in was the chair of the Messiah that nobody was supposed to sit in. It was reserved for the Messiah. When he sat in the chair, he said, this word has been fulfilled today in your hearing. In other words, I'm him. Wow. Now it says that the people's, now, you know, you go to church, I mean, you're here. There's times you doze off. There's times that you're kind of like, yeah, whatever, you know, I've heard this before. Or you do, do whatever. Now, well, maybe not. Let me, let me say the other churches down the street, that probably happens. Never here. But if it did, at that moment in that time, every eye was fixed on Jesus and fastened on him because, two, one, he skipped the normal reading, and two, he sat in the chair reserved for the Messiah, and people were fastened on him, and the revival of God was about to break out, and somebody said, isn't that Joseph's son? Yeah. And it all, they all broke focus. Yeah. 
Okay. So that was, it's an important thing. But then he says, in the Amplified, if you look, it says, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord when the favor of God profusely abounds. Why was he talking about favor profusely abounding in the acceptable year of the Lord? Because it was the year of Jubilee. Yeah. And it's been 40 and a half Jubilees since he died, which wasn't long after that. All right. Go to Luke 1. Probably already there and been waiting for me. Now in the sixth month, verse 26, I'm just reading this quick. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin Mary betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. It means she was not married yet. The virgin's name was Mary and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled by his saying, Consider what kind of manner this greeting was. The angel said to her, Don't be afraid. Mary, for you will have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb, bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Now, she was freaked out. I know she was freaked out. She wondered what was going on. She asked some questions, not because she wanted proof, but because she was ignorant and she wanted knowledge. The, the angel told her, don't worry, trust God. And then later on, it says she considered these words and held them in her heart. Then she went and saw her, uh, her, her cousin Elizabeth and, um, and they hung out for a little while. But what I want you to see here, and it goes on to say that you're going to have a Christ child. There'll be no end to his government and you're part of the no end. In fact, you are the no end of his government. Not only is there no end, there will be never be an end to his government on the earth until the earth is folded up. But there will never be an end of his government in heaven. It will always reproduce and multiply. Yeah. Heaven's not sitting on a cloud, stringing a you know, harp, listening. It's teaching. It's doing stuff. You're going to be moving around. Things are going to be going on. Heaven is very action focused. Okay. Now. He said this, and the word highly favored there was only used, only, this is really interesting, and I think the reason that she said, what kind of greeting is this, is because up until this time, in 4,000 years, these words were never said by an angel or anybody else. Highly favored. Highly favored is different from, some, from saying the favor of God is on you. It's different from all these other ones because the, the root word is charis, which means grace. A lot of people uh, name their children charis because it's, you know, it's just a popular name right now. But this, this the, not the correct pronunciation is uh, karatu, or ch char yeah, karatu, and what it means is chaste with grace. She was highly favored because she was receptive to God's grace. What did I just say? God doesn't give you what you want. He gives you what you can receive. And she was anxious to receive whatever God had. She could have said no. She could have said no. There was a lot of people. Uh, you know, I was talking to God one time about something. And he told me, you know, and it was about me obeying him. And he said, you know, Moses wasn't the first one I chose. He's the first one that said yes. Abraham, maybe it not have been the first one God chose, but he was the first one that said yes. You may not have been the first one God chose, but you may have been the first one that said yes. And that's what God's looking for is a yes. You know, when the yeses in your life are bigger than the noes, you won't have to worry about abstaining from sin and staying away from it because the yes will be so big that it'll drive you into the anointing of God for your life. All right. Now... This word karatu also means to make graceful, charming, lovely, agreeable. How many of you would like that? How many of you would like that for your spouse? Let me just say that. That'll get you excited. To pursue with grace, compass with favor, to honor with blessings. And it's all in the reception. This is not mentioned again in the word until Ephesians 1. Now go to Ephesians 1. Why am I telling you this? Because... This is what increased favor this season that we're in has to do with. Okay, in Ephesians 1 and verse 3 says this, Blessed be the God and, our fa God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So let me ask you, where is this taking place? Where is this scripture? Heaven. Spiritual blessing, heavenly places. Where are we supposed to be? We're supposed to live heaven to earth, not earth to heaven. We've been seated at the right hand of majesty with Jesus. When you start seeing the word as a child who believes instead of adult, an adult that's been processed, you know, by the time people really start understanding the word, they've been through a lot of processing in their life. 
The difference between a processed item and an organic item is the processed is a lot less nutritional. The organic has a lot more nutrients in it. We have to read the word organically. And the way that you read the word organically is reading is it a child who is pure and innocent. Because you are pure and innocent on the inside. Your spirit is pure and innocent. It will never be more pure and innocent than it is right now. We just got to get that pure and innocent on the outside. Our outside, because we know that we're renewing our mind according to the word, according to teaching. Okay, he goes on to say, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Christ Jesus to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Some people see this and they say, well, see, there's predestination. Everybody's saved. Gnosticism says everybody's saved. Everybody's going to make it. That's not true. If everybody's saved, then nobody has a choice. Yeah. Everybody's got to have a choice to be saved. Yeah. Jesus has predestined every person from Adam till the end of the world to be saved. Yeah. That is his predestined will. Yeah. But you can break his predestined will by saying no. Yeah. You, you just can. You know, and, and I, I've used this, question, this a lot. Hey, you know, Amy doesn't want me to love me to love her because somebody's got a gun at my head saying, "You better love her, or you're going to die." Yeah. There's no choice in that. Yeah. She wants me to choose to love her. How many of you ladies want to be chosen? You want to be chosen. A lot of us husbands need to keep choosing. Sometimes you get married 15, 20 years, you stop choosing. You're just living. Or I say, say you're just getting by. If you want to know how to have a good marriage and you've got kids, tell them this. Guys, I just want to let you know that if the house is on fire and I'm outside, I'm coming for your mother first. I chose her. I didn't choose you. Now, your, your, your wife will love it, hopefully. <laughs> Unless she loves the kids more than she loves you. Then you're going to have issues. But I tell people often when they have marriage issues, who do you love more? See, it's impossible to love what was produced by the one you chose more than the one you chose. It's, this is not, and this is not even like complicated, deep, whoa stuff. It's just, it doesn't make sense. I love her more than I love my kids. I chose her. She chose me. I hope she would get me out first too. <laughs> I'm not asking, though, because I don't want the answer. Okay. Next verse. Having predestined us to adoption, sons of Christ Jesus, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace. Notice these words, grace. By which, okay, so grace came first. See, favor never comes without grace. Grace is that empowerment to do what He's called you to do while not having the power to do it on your own. It says according to His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. I want to tell you, accepted in the Beloved is highly favored. It's karatu. It's the same thing Gabriel said to Mary. Wow. And it's only said twice in the Scripture. One, the first time about the one that would bring grace into the world. The second time, about those who would walk in high favor in the world. From heaven. I wrote this down. Let me say it. God called the one who brought grace into the world highly favored because the ones he would bring into heaven would affect the world with high favor. Guys, you need to recognize you're highly favored. People don't walk in favor because they're not aware that they're favored. People make money according to what they're aware they can make. I'm making myself more aware all the time with my, I, I say this a lot during the day, I'm telling, I'm telling myself who I am. You, you, your conscious mind has to tell your subconscious mind who you are or your subconscious mind will keep you a loser the rest of your life. Because most of the time people aren't taught how to think, they're taught to repeat. They're taught just, just say nothing and do what you're told. Kids are... Kids are creative until they get into a system that drives creativity out of them. 
and tells them, conform. Be like everybody else. Now, I'm not, so there's a lot of great teachers out there, so I'm not talking bad about any educational system, but I am saying it would be a lot better if they were taught how to think instead of how to memorize and take tests. All right. Took Amy and I a long time to figure that out, but we got there. All right, Luke, Luke 2.52. This is all going somewhere. You are highly favored. You are as highly favored as Gideon's word to Mary. You notice Jesus was never called highly favored? Because he came from highly favored. You are what you came from. Spiritually speaking. Physically speaking, no. You are not where you came from in the natural realm. You are not bound by where you came from, by what people said about you, by what your parents told you you were or you weren't, by what your teacher said. You better not, I don't think you're going to go to college. You need to, you know, just go dig ditches. Don't listen. If anything has been told to you with ne- that's been negative or had negative tone, dismiss it from your library. Amen. Amen. Francis Frangipan said, if there is any area of your life that's not sparkling with hope, and hope is always future, you're believing a lie. We have to stop believing lies about ourselves because no one else can stop believing the lie for you. That's right. That's right. I can give you the best message. I can yell at the right times and use my hands right and all that other kind of stuff, but I can't stop believing the lie for you. You've got to stop believing it. That's right. But I sure ain't give you the tools. I sure can't tell you you're highly favored. Yeah. That God chose you. Yeah. Man, He chose you. And all you had to do was say yes. And when you said yes, you got highly favored. Yeah. Highly favored. Not just favored. And the more you steward your favoring, the more favor you get. Yeah. It's like if you do good on a job, you get promoted. God's the same way. He loves everybody the same, but he doesn't give everybody the same favor. Because he knows people people will use it. And people he knows if Tony Tony is favored for evangelism. He knows if Tony's on the job or he's anywhere and he runs up against an unsaved person, bam, he's getting them saved or he's gonna try real hard. And he'll lay hands on them for, to get healed, too. That's why. Because even if... I get... Uh, Todd White. Todd White, crazy evangelist dude. He's not even... He just says it's living evangelism, whatever. He's got dreadlocks. He's weird. But he's really good. He, he got radically saved, which is really should be how everybody got saved. It's pretty radical to change races because you said words. But anyway... Because when we're a new creation, we're, we're a new race of people. And so Todd White, for the first uh, he, four, month, four months or six months, six months, he said, I'm going to do what Jesus did. I'm going to go lay hands on people and see him healed. And so, and he was just a baby Christian. And I guarantee you there's people that hate Todd White. Christians that hate Todd White. Yeah. Because he walks in more anointing that they've been praying for for the last 40 years. Because, but because they're so blinded by pride, they can't get it. Because God will never deposit that which is holy into a prideful vessel. <clears throat> can't do it. And so he said, I'm going to go out and pray for people. The first six months he prayed for people. He said, I'm going to pray for how many people was it a day? He said, I think it was six people or four people. Maybe it was either six people a day for four months or four people a day for six months. One of those two. But every time he would pray for somebody, they wouldn't get healed. they get nothing. Now, most of us probably would get discouraged and say, well, this don't work. But you have to have character to support the favor. God needs to know even when you don't see it work, you'll keep working. But four months came around. And he's praying for somebody. Bam, they get healed. Yeah. I imagine he was excited. Yeah. Why? Because God saw, I can put favor, I can trust him with favor for healing and leading people to the Lord. Because he's been doing it with no results for so long. Now, I guarantee you that some of those people that he prayed for in those first four or six months got healed. Not, it just didn't happen when he could see it. Yeah. Why? Because we rely so much on sight. We're sight motivated. We're sight. Uh, that's where we get our knowledge and stuff. And so anyway, 
God wants to put favor on you at an increasingly high level. We just have to have the courage to support it. Okay, in Luke 2.52, the Joseph and Mary had been looking for Jesus. You know, they, this is when Jesus went missing. Now, I don't know about you, but if you're a mother and dad, and you have a child, and they go missing for more than an hour, you freak out. Now, this child has been missing for five days, and he's the son of God. You're really freaking out. The world's going to die and go in the hell in a handbasket. I lost Jesus. Joseph's writing his own obituary. Mary's freaking out. She's telling everybody in her family, we're all doomed to hell. We lost Jesus! <laughs> Now, maybe she wasn't saying all that. But, you know, can you imagine the, the, the pressure available to Mary and Joseph to live? You know, Joseph knows, they both know, this is the Son of God, the Messiah, the one all of Israel has been waiting for. I guarantee you, I, I've said this, I think Jesus got disciplined. I think that he made mistakes and that he got, he got, he got disciplined for them. Um, and this may have been one of those times. You know, she says, uh, look, we've been looking all over you. You know, you've been making us anxious here. We've been worried sick. This is the, my translation, but it says it there. And Jesus says, well, why have you been looking for me? I've been in my father's house doing what I'm supposed to do. That is not what I would tell my mother if I was gone for five days. I would be praying, God, send your angels to protect me. I was missing for six hours one time. I hid in a cornfield. Most of you have heard this story. I hid in a cornfield and watched everybody around looking for me laughing. I thought it was the most hilarious thing. I was squatting down. I'd poke my head up every once in a while and look around. And the, the farmer that was had the cornfield, he was looking for me. Hey, my mom had the whole earth looking for me. Oh my God. She found me. Somebody said, called her and said, Susie, Mary Jay's hiding in the cornfield. He's squatting down and he's, he thinks this is funny. She, they could have left that out of the conversation. My mom goes to the front porch. She was very creative. She is a very creative woman. She grabbed an American flag on a dowel rod about thick as my thumb. She rolled that flag up. She came down to the end of the corn row. I looked down and saw her. I have never run from my mom before, but that day I ran. I knew it was about to happen. She chased, and boy, that day she was, she was, she was, she was Jesse Owens. I mean, she was moving. And she got to me, and I remember every step I took to the house was whap, 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 whap. Now, I don't think that happened to Jesus, but I was only missing six hours. And my mom was going nuts. You can imagine the pressure of raising Jesus. And then you lose him. We go, so here's where we pick up. It says um, in 252... Oh, I'm in Ephesians. I'm sorry. Oh, he says, where you been? He says, I've been, uh, I've been in my father's house. She, she took it. Now I got to read it because it is so good. There's, there's an important, there's something important you need to see about this because it's how favor happens. Next week, we're going to talk about th four sources of favor and then pray and believe God for increased favor. But this is important. It says here, so when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them. Now, watch this. And came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept this, all these things in her heart. And. This is important and. Jesus went back with his earthly parents. He knew who he was and was subject to them. In other words, he humbled himself because they are my parents and I'm going to honor them. And it was only when he humbled himself and honored him. This is the first time it said in Jesus' life. It says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Yeah. Your willingness to walk in humility will determine your usefulness to God in your life. And Jesus said, I've got to be humble. They don't understand everything that I'm called to. But I'm going to be humble and subject to them. And his subjection to his earthly mom and dad increased his favor with God and man. That favor there is charis. 
And it means this. It refers to God freely extending himself, his favor and grace, reaching, inclining to people because he's disposed to bless them and be near them. I want to show you what this looks like. This, this word, favor, actually means this. That God, he's in the heavens and he's like this. He's leaning into you. He's watching. God's always watched us. But he's not watching us to pop us on the head because we did wrong. He's watching us because he knows we're going to do what's right. He knows we're going to follow him. And he's looking like this. And he's looking and he's saying, what's your name, sweetie? Zo- huh? Chloe. Chloe. Yeah, Chloe and he, your brother. Um, <laughs> I forgot who it is. But he's, he's like, hey, Chloe, I know she's going to do it. I know she's going to do it. I can't wait for her to do this. When she does this, I'm just going to, I'm going to bless her so big. Yeah. That's what he's doing. That's what he's doing all the time with everybody. And he's big enough that he can do it with everybody. And he's looking at you. I mean, he's like... He's like a kid so happy to give something. It's like a kid that gives a present to his parents that paid for the present to give to the parent. He's a, and he thinks he did it. I mean, God. I mean, he's like, you know, he's almost like, whoa, getting a little Pentecostal here. He, it's almost like he's the dog. Now, don't, 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 don't nobody say I said God was a dog. He's like the little puppy dog at the door waiting for somebody to come home because he just wants to love them. Yeah. He's excited. God's emotional. People don't want to think it, but he is. Emotion's okay as long as you rule it and don't let it rule you. All right. Now, favor and identity. There's a difference in becoming something and doing something. Hear this. This is important. In grace and favor, God requires us to perform according to what we've become, not to perform to become. Now, there's a big difference. You guys, you get this. That you were given, when you said yes to Jesus, you were given a grace. It was dispensed and put on you. That grace in your life is all-encompassing. It's the kingdom in you. And your favor is in the grace. As you begin to walk in the grace, the favor comes to light. You, you realize what it is. And God dispenses it. He gives it more and more. In fact, he says he gives more and more grace to the humble. In James, I think it's James or it's Peter. But what I want you to see is that... I felt like I lost my place there for a second. You are already what you're supposed to be. You just have to discover what it is. And he's given you the grace to discover. So many people spend their whole life. In, in Daniel 11.32 it says, Those that know their God shall, uh, shall, be, uh, shall be saved and do great things. I think that's it. It's no be do. When you know God, and there's another scripture we were going to look at, and it's in the next part. It's in, um, no, it's not Ephesians, it's one of the Gospels. Uh, the first thing is the reason God gives you grace is to show that He loves you. Second reason is to draw you into a relationship. And the relationship with God is so key to anything because uh, it's in one of the Gospels. Some guys came to Him and said, Lord, Lord, we cast out demons in Your name. We did all this in Your name. And He says to Him, Depart from me. I never knew you. So there's one thing that's more important than you knowing God, and that's God knowing you. And so God knows you through relationship. God knows you through time. I woke up this morning, and uh, I told God, I said, you're the best friend. You're just the best friend. I just love you so much. And I can't ever say I love the Father without saying, Jesus, I love you, and Holy Spirit, I love you too. I, don't, I feel like one of them is going to get disappointed if I don't say it to them. And so <laughs> I don't want to give any of them a, a complex, so I just make sure I include them all. <laughs> but the, the grace that God so freely gives, we have to walk in. The more we walk in, the more we receive. And the, what I'm wanting you, to, wanting you to see in this is that you already are. You have already become. Now you're just walking in the power according to your becoming. You can't ever do anything to deserve grace. Yeah. You can never earn it. That's right. God has this thing about wanting credit for what's he get, what He gives. I don't think He's an ego. To, he's ego driven. I just think that He wants us to be able to live like Him, and in order to do that. You have to be humble enough to say, what I have is not mine. It was given to me freely. All right, just run through these things real quick and we'll be done. Then listen to this. 
I'm going to read that again. And it's, in grace and favor, God requires us to perform according to what we have become instead of performing in order to become. This is why you can't copy favor. A lot of people see favor in other people's lives and say, I want that. I want to do that. Some of you, I've seen this a lot with pastoring. I've seen it a lot with leading. Not everybody, and I, I say everybody is a leader. You're always leading somebody. However, not everybody is meant to pastor. Not everybody is meant to lead an organization. There's a, there's a lot of people that are, and there's a lot of people that aren't. And when somebody tries, and especially I've seen it in, this, in, the, in, the, in pastoring or ministry, when somebody says, um, I'm thinking of one church in particular, there was a pastor there, uh, the church blew up, it grew and everything, and the pastor had a falling out and did some things that were wrong, and, and uh, the people on the board said, well, that guy, he preaches good, he should be our pastor. Biggest mistake you can make for man to appoint instead of Jesus. Jesus said, I have called some to be apostles, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers, gifts according to God. God calls. Man doesn't call. Man confirms who God calls. And there should be fruit on their tree before there's a title over their name. There should be fruit on your tree before there's a title over your name. Some people are just title centered. I'm out and recently had a guy come. He was telling me he wanted me to put him in the lineup to be a pastor if we ever started another church. There's a guy. I've had people come tell me they want me to make them my uh, them my associate pastor, and they've they've come for two weeks. And I'm just like, relax, man. I mean, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but relax. Just come to church. And I, I tell you what, I, I, I weed a lot of people out that do that because I don't give those things away. Now there is a proving. But sometimes when people just want a title, they want the power of the title and not the work it takes to get there. Okay. All right. So just real quick, you want the favor God's given you, not the favor God's given someone else because you don't have the character to support their favor. It's just like David couldn't wear Saul's armor. He hadn't tested it. It was too big for him. It didn't work right. He couldn't operate as well with that. Did you, oh, man, I... <laughs> At close range, I just I just found out about this. They, they in the Israeli army they had slingers, guys that were crafted. I mean, they knew how to sling a stone. And in um, in that area, in that region, all the stones were very very dense, really heavy. And so when David slung that, he'd done it a lot of times before. And he had more trust in what he had experience in than taking Saul's big sword and armor and trying to scare the giant. It's said that at close range, like probably from here to that back wall, these guys were deadly accurate and that it was like it had the force and impact of a 44 Magnum. If anybody ever says I'm a good slinger, just stay away from them. <laughs> this is why people need a God esteem, not a self esteem. Billions of dollars are being made on people trying to get people's self esteem up when the very thing they need is to find out their identity in God. Grace in your life has the identity of who you are. If you just begin to walk in it, you'll find out. My people, you shall know God. Be strong, do great things. That's the order. No be do. All right, real quickly. The first thing, you, reason, favor comes is expression of God's love and affection towards you. Um, you know, sometimes people get healed here when they've been prayed for a lot of different other places. I had a young man come in one time, and um, they came specifically to get to get prayed for. It, we weren't having church, and uh, he couldn't hear out of his right ear. He'd had ear infection since he was a child, and... Um, I, I, instead of praying for him, I sat down and started talking to him and just got him to laugh a little bit. When you laugh, you open up. I don't care who you are. If you will allow yourself to laugh, you can't laugh and be mad at the same time. Yeah. That's why when you're so mad at your wife, you won't laugh at anything yeah. or your husband or somebody else. Because to laugh means to give up. Yeah. Some people need to give up. So anyway... Um, he came in and I talked to him, started la laughing a little bit. And I told, I started asking him some questions. And as I did, he was answering. And he'd been prayed for and prayed for and prayed for. And he said, I don't think it's going to work because, you know, I've been prayed for so many times. I said, all right. Well, God's cool and I believe this and that and the other. Anyway, the Lord gave me a word. I said, is there something missing in your ear? 
And he was like, well, yeah, there's part of my right eardrum's missing. And I said, all right, well, we're going to pre- believe for a creative miracle. I said, Lord, I'm reaching into heaven believing for that, that part of that ear or a replacement. And we're just going to speak to that. I put my hands on his ears. I said, does anything happen? Or no, I put my hands on his ears. He went like that. And I was like, what happened? I believe he, he was kind of stunned. I said, well, I just had a pop in my ear. And right here, he received healing in his ear. He went back to the doctors, and the doctors said, "Well, you're, everything's fine." And um, the doctor said, "What happened?" He said, "God healed me." And then I also, his sister also, one of her legs, she'd been dealing with scoliosis or something forever, and one of her legs was notably shorter, and uh, we prayed for it, and leg, either the back adjusted or the leg grew out. She went, and she started telling everybody where she came from, God heal me, God heal me. They were just real simple kids, and they just loved the fact God, well, God used us for that, and they'd be prayed for before, but God favored us to do it. It doesn't mean that we're better. It just means he chose to do it here. Okay, in... Um, and then also, when God gives you favor, read Proverbs twenty seven twenty one, because it says that men are tried by the praise given to them. Your trial is in the praise that you get. Because when you receive praise from men and you start relying on praise from men, you'll die by their criticism. Okay, next one was just, it's used to draw you closer into a relationship. I told you about that. Uh, it's getting to know God. It's uh, what Moses says in Psalms, it says that uh, Israel knew the acts of God, but Moses knew his ways. So you never get drawn into the way of God without seeing his acts. You see what he does, you recognize his love, and you enter into his way, which is his nature. And so I know the nature of God beyond a shadow of doubt. I've seen it happen too much. I know that he loves people. I know that he heals. You couldn't convince me otherwise. I've been uh, two times in my life. uh, I've been at death's door and God healed me. I had 25 car accidents, totaled seven cars. I should be dead, but the angels preserved me because of a praying mother. Don't stop praying for your kids. Okay, last thing. Kings, 1 Kings 10, 9. It says that David was empowered. Or David was given favor for the nation of Israel. The last thing I want to tell you is this. God will always empower you. He will always give you grace and favor for those around you. And that the cycle of favor is never complete until you have exposed somebody to it and they become relentlessly in love for God, with God. Everything else runs out when you give it away, but favor grows. It grows in your life. It grows in the life of those around you. And there's a scripture we're going to look at in Ephesians 4 next week. It says every word we speak should be incorruptible and full of favor. Any word spoken out of faith is corruptible. Any word spoken in faith is prophetic. Because faith is never believing for what's already here. Faith is always believing for what you can't see. So you've got to recognize. And then Queen of Sheba came to Solomon. Oh, I got this one last point. She came to Solomon and she said, Clearly the Lord has favored you for the nation of Israel. Solomon, when he was young, in a dream, asked God. God said, What do you want? He said, I want wisdom. I want a heart. Actually, what he said is, I want a hearing heart to lead Israel well. And God gave him, answered his prayer in a dream. When God learns to trust you while you're awake, he'll trust you to make decisions while you're asleep. And the last thing was this. God came to uh, David and said, you can't build the temple. You've been favored to war. You've been favored to shed blood. But you can't build the temple because you're a man of bloodshed. It didn't seem fair to me when he said that to David because all the blood that he shed, most of it, was commanded by God and the victories were given to him. But it was to bring the people of Israel back to a place of righteousness. But he was not a man of peace. He was a man of war. Because you've shed blood, you can't build the temple. But I will let you earn, raise the money, raise the, uh, the, the store up to build it. And we looked at it. The, the temple, I think it costs like, to build the temple, it was around $600 billion. It was a cra- crazy amount. I, I told everybody what it was a few weeks or months ago. But he said, your son will build the temple. He's going to be a man of peace. I want you to recognize Jesus went to the cross and shed blood. Jesus was in a tumultuous time. He was in a war time. And blood was shed. But we get to enter into the peace because of his shed blood. We get to be the builders. Solomon was the builder. David was the preparer. Jesus was the preparer. We're the builders. Because of his shed blood, we enter into the price he paid. And we get to build the church. We get to build the kingdom. Amen?